So I just want to start with my conflicts. I have nothing to spare. And let's start with a little bit of history. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as you have already heard, was historically considered to be the leading cause of death in young athletes. As a result, individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy were restricted to low dynamic, low static sports. We know that 55% of individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy fail to meet current exercise recommendations. The fact that they can't exercise leads to a sedentary lifestyle. And we know from registry studies that the prevalence of obesity and pre-obesity reaches 70%. This leads to an increase on a knock-on effect on cardiovascular risk, and obviously not to mention the adverse psychological impact, particularly in those who are high-flying athletes. However, there has been a paradigm shift in our attitudes towards exercise and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in recent times. We heard um, from Prof Shepard about the change in the kind of causes of or what is thought to be the leading cause of sudden cardiac death. And now studies from Finichiaro et al. at St George's show that up to 42 percent of deaths in athletes are attributable to sudden arrhythmic death syndrome with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy accounting for around 6 percent. Clinical phenotyping in athletes has also shown um, that those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy compared to a sedentary cohort had superior diastolic indices, greater wall ca um, LV cavity sizes and less hypertrophy compared to the sedentary counterparts. And interestingly, it may be that they are just more able to exercise because they've got a, a less severe phenotype, or maybe exercise has a positive effect on the remodeling of the heart. And in a study of mice, those that had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who began exercising at two months versus six months showed inhibition of myocardial fibrosis and disarray. And those who started exercising at six months only showed reversal of um, myocardial disarray, suggesting that if you exercise early enough, you may be able to stave off some of the pathology that develops. So I just want to take you through some of the studies um, that are sort of key in the last few years. So Reset HCM was a study in middle-aged individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They were randomly assigned to 16 weeks of exercise um, or usual care, and that was home-based exercise unsupervised. So in week one, they had three sessions, 20 minutes each at 60% of their heart rate reserve and a Borg scale, which is the subjective scale of uh, corresponding to moderate intensity. And then weeks two to four, they built this up to four to seven sessions per week week, 25 to 60 minutes per session, again at 70% of the heart rate reserve, and they were meant to maintain this up to week 16. So what we saw was an increase in peak met, so in terms of the exercise capacity, an absolute change in VO2 of 6%, um, and a between group difference of plus 1.27 mils per kilogram per minute, improved physical functioning, but nothing really in terms of quality of life, and no adverse events. So that was basically death, cardiac arrest, or ICD shocks, despite the fact that 30% had ICDs and 4% a prior history of sustained VT or aborted sudden cardiac arrest and there was also a reduction in PVC burden and as you can see in the table there was no increase in non-fatal arrhythmias. We also have here at St George's and also in Italy conducted observational studies into athletes. So I'll start with the Italian study. So what they did is they looked at 88 athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, of which 98% were male, most were white with a relatively low ESC risk score. And they divided them into those who stopped competing and those who continued. And you can see over seven years of follow up, there was two that experienced sudden cardiac arrest. I think they were both in the recreational group. One was post myectomy and one was walking in a shopping centre. And in our study, we looked at athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There were 53 of them, similar cohort, but we had a little bit more diversity in terms of 72% were white. Um, and in 4.5 years of follow-up, we showed no deaths, sustained VT or syncope. And we interestingly looked at the um, electrical, structural and, and functional phenotypes at the first and last um, assessment and we found no difference in that either. You'd expect an event rate uh, of about 1.2 to 2.4 sudden cardiac death events if you're assuming an event rate of 0.5 to 1% mortality per year. So this would be lower than expected. So we also have some in, uh, investigations into ICDs, which is essentially using a rhythmic risk as a kind of surrogate for sudden cardiac death. So 440 athletes were followed up over a 44 month period of which 75 had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. There were no deaths related to arrhythmia, no aborted sudden cardiac death and no injury following syncope or shock during exercise. And ARVC had the highest rate of shocks during competition or exercise compared to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which had the least. So that was 2% versus 15%. 
Now, this brings me on to my study that I conducted during my PhD. So this was the SAFE HCM study. And what we did is we took individuals and we randomized them to 12 weeks of supervised high intensity exercise for 12 weeks, uh, um, going from 70% to 85% of their heart rate reserve. Um, and what we showed was that there was an increase in exercise capacity, which you can see in the graphs um, on the left hand side of the screen. So improvements in the exercise group in total exercise time, peak VO2, VO2 at the anaerobic threshold and time to the anaerobic threshold, as well as an improvement in cardiovascular risk factors, so systolic blood pressure and BMI. And we also showed a clinically meaningful difference in the anxiety and depression scores. And importantly, we didn't show an increase in arrhythmias in the exercise group. The recently published live HCM study is a prospective observational study of around 1600 individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what they did is they, across the world, essentially followed up these individuals who self-reported their physical activity as vigorous, which was greater than one activity of greater than six METs for 60 hours per year, moderate, which was greater than one activity of four to 5.9 METs for greater than 60 hours per year, and then sedentary were all the others. And when we look at their outcome, which was a composite of death, sudden cardiac arrest, a rhythmic syncope and appropriate ICD shock, 4.6 um, people a percent of the population met this outcome. But if you look at the graph, which shows the probability of experiencing the composite outcome, there was no difference between the vigorous and the non-vigorous groups. However, we have to have a word of caution at this point. You have to realise that one size does not fit all. We've heard about Prof Malhotra's study with um, the young footballers. Eight of the deaths, um, three of which were contributed to by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this suggests that actually maybe we should be thinking about young individuals as higher risk. There's also um, this table that I took from Dresner's paper, and you can see that in the sort of uh, let me use a pointer here. You can see that the annual mortality rate from HCM related sudden cardiac death is much higher in black individuals and also maybe in certain sports. So division one male basketball. And we know that football and American football also fall into this category. And the final study that was quite interesting. Um, this was a study looking at the genetic material that was obtained after sudden cardiac death in 400 individuals and 20 percent uh, were found to have pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants for cardiomyopathy or um, channelopathies. And interestingly here, 45 individuals um, had a likely pathogenic or pathogenic variant in the HCM gene, so MYBPC3 and MYH7. So maybe we should be thinking about whether our patient has a gene as well and whether that could be a contributing factor to risk. So in terms of just a very quick um, look at exercise prescription, so what some of you will be doing, um, some of you won't know how to do, but this is just a brief outline. It's really important to assess your ind individual in front of you with a history and examination. You're looking for red flag symptoms. If they had uh, syncope during exercise, did they get chest pain, breathlessness, any family history of premature sudden cardiac death, the echo, you can get a lot of information about wall thickness, um, left ventricular outflow tract radiant under various um conditions, left atrial size, left ventricular function, then you can look at your kind of functional capacity, your peak VO2, the hemodynamic response to exercise, and importantly, whether they get arrhythmias during exercise, be that on an exercise test or during um, halter monitoring while they're training or during competition. And a cardiac CMR may give us um, some good information about fibrosis and ischemia. So if we look at the ESC guidelines of 2020, the markers of increased risk are um, concerning features in terms of symptoms, their past medical history, the elevated ESC risk score, but remember that wasn't actually validated in athletes, but it is the best thing that we have, left ventricular outflow gradient being high, abnormal blood pressure response um, and exercise induced arrhythmias. So if they have none of those, I mean, it's a shared decision making process, but you can discuss with the athlete about whether you know, you're both happy to kind of carry on with their competitive sport and, and have regular follow up. And then for those who have any of these high risk features, you might want to limit them to low moderate, depending on what those are. And that's obviously after discussion with everybody involved. So a basic approach to exercise prescription. So we know that the WHO recommendations mandate that everybody should be engaged in 150 minutes of exercise or of moderate intensity or 75 of high intensity and strength training at least two days a week. So the important thing is frequency. So you need to prescribe frequency, the intensity, so low, moderate or high. I tend to go on heart rate reserve, but you can also use a VO2 max if you have a CPET. And then you can also do that with strength training. So um, one RM is basically 100% of one RM is how much can you lift through one range of motion um, just once. So the maximum weight you can lift um, and you can 
prescribe based on that as to what you want to achieve. Um, then you need to give them a time for the exercise session and then obviously the type of exercise. And I've put in this um, diagram down here, exercise examples. And I think the key thing is a review date. So you make sure you follow them up depending on risk. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour through all of the history of HCM and exercise. Um, so I invite you to ask any questions and thank you for your attention.